good morning, everyone. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna switch topic pretty drastically. I think one of the cool things about Slush is the uh, diversity in the type of things that are are brought here. And so going from sustainable food production to uh, video games, I'm really excited to uh, to be here and yeah, sh shed some light on on this uh, vertical. Um, so before we start, I just want to ask the audience. How many people here play games, like consider themselves a gamer? Uh, how many play PC games? Uh, mobile games? Uh, any League of Legends players or eSport fans? You are? OK. What about Fortnite? Well, not a lot of gamers. Uh, what about Candy Crush? OK. Um, cool. So I guess using that as a, a start-off point, wanted to uh, to ask you, Dan, uh, very high level. Like, what what are the platforms, geographies that are, are most exciting to you um, and, and Tencent right now? Sure. Um, can I check? I think. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, great to be here back at Slush. Uh, thanks for everybody joining us today, Jason. Um, you know, I, honestly, I, I'm kind of playing to the crowd, but you know, the Nordics is obviously one of the most exciting geographies uh, for gaming globally. Uh, this is my my fifth slush and 20 or 30th trip to Finland in the past couple of years, and and it's always impressive what comes out of uh, not just Finland but the rest of the Nordics as well. Um, Europe in general is very exciting for games. Uh, America is also where we spend a lot of our our time and focus. Uh, I think as a Chinese company, of course, we've been very lucky to be in the Chinese market, which has been growing very rapidly over the past few years. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing some strong growth in other regions as well, but it seems like for us at least, you know, the US, China, Europe, sort of the main uh, uh, territories uh, for games uh, that we, we play in, uh, we have less, less experience in some of the other territories, but that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. Got it. Um... And so one of the first, uh, uh, I guess, trends that will, is on a lot of people's mind is this idea of gaming becoming more uh, mainstream. It seems like more and more people are uh, engaging actively with gaming content, playing games themselves. Um, how, do you see that, uh, how do you see that kind of playing out? Yeah, I think you know, uh, I'm a little bit older than the average uh, crowd, I suppose. But when I was growing up, it still wasn't really cool to play games in America. It's, you, know, you did it, but it wasn't something that was very common. And one of the interesting things that I think for, for kids these days is you know, it, it is cool to, to be a gamer. And, and it's not something that you have to hide. Or, you know, and, and as sort of nerd culture has taken over, like, you know, being a dungeon master in D and D is now something that's cool, and and so as that you know sort of uh, the comic culture extends through Western society, just it, a lot more people end up playing into games. You know, a lot of people you ask people to self-identify as a gamer, and you know we had a lot of gamers here, and that's great. But there's a lot of people who won't raise their hand and say I'm a gamer. But then if you ask them, if you look at their you know screen time for what they've been playing on their phone, or what, what's been on their phone open, or what's on their PC, and, and yeah, they've spent a lot, you know, six hours or 12 hours in the last week, you know, playing this game, but they don't consider themselves a gamer, and so I think that's been good for the whole industry, is it gets more mainstream, you get a lot more people dropping into it, it and, and you get a lot more sort of innovation emerging as more people, it becomes more common for people. Yeah, and, and I think to your point, it, it does seem like it's not just a subculture anymore in, in different parts of the world. Um, especially China, for example. I think League of Legends was actually the most watched sport of any kind. So more hours viewed last year than the NBA and then uh, like professional football. Um, and so it, it's becoming more and more a part of people's lives outside of the, uh, the actual in-game experience. Um, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, we're very happy this year. Uh, for the first time ever, a Chinese team won. Uh, the, the, the World Championships of the League. And it was a, you know, it was a cultural event in China. You yeah. know, like, it wasn't quite like, you know, the, the trains stop and everybody goes on the streets and celebrates like if you win the World Cup. But it was, it, it was an event. It was, it was a, a major occurrence. And, and, and I think the West is also becoming, is becoming more mainstream uh, for, for those types of events when you have, uh, you know, like major streamers, uh, you know, television shows, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Fortnite phenomenon that's occurred, you know, uh, sort of recently. Uh, it, it's interesting to see how uh, the new generation is so excited by, uh, by all that. And, yeah, I think it's really good for the industry overall. Yeah. And to that point around these games that have really large global audience, so games like uh, Fortnite, League of Legends, it seems like it, it's becoming ever more important for companies to kind of build and engage communities as like a core strategy for uh, launching games and running games. Like, how do you see 
kind of the importance of communities uh, impacting games going forward? Yeah, so we've always believed that, especially for a game as a service or, or you know, games that go on for a long time, the strength of communities is really strong. And League is really, you know, Riot is really the, one of the preeminent examples of that. Uh, but we also see it in a lot of other areas where, where a community comes together and, and, and finds themselves online or, or offline, you know, uh, in the old days. Um, and and they, they, they gravitate towards a certain experience and a shared social experience. And, you know, while, while League was a, a huge example, I mean, there's lots of other... Uh, smaller examples, I mean, um, uh, or more, more niche examples, I should say. Uh, you know, there's a, a company in New Zealand called Grinding Gear Games. They make a game called Path of Exile. I don't know if any, anybody here play Path of Exile? It's not a huge game, but those who play it are really hardcore. So thank you. So, so it drops a new season every, every quarter, and, and when they drop a new season, they, they share it to their Reddit forum, and Reddit, the front page of the internet, and, and not every time, but you know, every other time maybe, it makes it to the number one post on all of Reddit. Because it's a kind of a small community of, I don't know, tens or hundreds of thousands of members in the, the Reddit subforum. But they're so excited about when their game drops a new, le a new season that it becomes the most popular thing on the internet overall that day. And, and so it's really impressive to see sort of like the strength of these strong communities and the, the number of years that they will stay together and form friends and meet up offline and have gatherings. Um, I mean. Uh, sorry, another example closer to home is, uh, I don't know if everybody uh, uh, here is from Stockholm or plays uh, Paradox games, uh, but Paradox Interactive makes some really deep uh, grand strategy games that are super popular amongst you know, grand strategy fans. and Very complex, very deep uh, experiences that go for years, and they have a gathering every, every summer in, in, uh, in Stockholm. I think, I think this year is actually in Berlin in October uh, for PDXCon. And, uh, and it's great to see the, the, the offline support that comes from these, these communities that play the game for a long time online, but then will also gather offline, become real world friends, you know, et cetera. Yeah, and I, I think to, to that point, this idea of people playing games becoming not necessarily just something they do in their off time or something they do uh, behind closed doors, but it's something that becomes part of people's identity and extends outside of like when they're actually sitting in front of their computer or on their phone screen playing the games. They're actually using it as a way to connect with uh, other people with obviously similar interests, and uh, and yeah, seeing how it's driving a lot of uh, different types of content and different forms of entertainment uh, outside of the game itself. Um, I think one one other recent trend uh, is this idea of operating a game as a service. So no longer are companies just like launching a product at retail with a big bang and then hoping that people will stick. Um, how do you see? Like this uh, kind of shift in strategy impacting how yeah how game companies uh, go moving forward. Yeah, I, I think this is a really good cross pollination that's kind of occurred between east and west. I I, I, I must confess I'm not actually a gamer. I'm, I'm not like I, I would I'd probably you know I, I'm not like a, a rioter who who is a, a hardcore gamer. I, I played some games growing up, but I'm not a super hardcore gamer. So I've only been doing this for a few years. But when I started. When I, when I joined the company five years ago and started you know, interacting with more and more games companies, I noticed that in China and Korea and Asian games companies tended to be these free-to-play but operated for a very long time, uh, you know, live operations or games as a service, whereas the Western you know, gaming market, you know, mobile free-to-play was just sort of beginning. Uh, PC was, had a little bit of free-to-play, not too much, and console really didn't have much of anything at that time. Um, and if you fast forward to today, over the past five years, all of the Western sort of console and or mobile and or PC, uh, there, there's still a great um, paid game ecosystem that exists. Sure. But on top of that has now been layered a great free to play, games as a service, live operations uh, type of business model that has allowed the Western gaming companies to just enjoy a tremendous you know, success, uh, uh, continued uh, uh, success and, and, and greater success in recent years. Um, and, and that cross-pollination sort of from east to west has, has worked really well. And there's lots of things we've taken from west to east as well, but yeah. you know, that, that's a, a great example of something that I saw sort of, you know, Western companies discover a, a new business model that can, that can do really well for them there. Yeah, and uh, along those lines, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of developers used to trust and trust third-party publishers with the ability to launch games because they had relationships at retail, distribution, et cetera. And I think you see uh, more and more Western developers consider self-publishing, building their own infrastructure to directly connect with gamers. And uh, I think you see that now most obviously with uh, uh, like Blizzard for Overwatch, uh, Riot for League of Legends, and Epic for Fortnite. Um, 
So let, let's talk a bit about a couple of the, uh, the genres that have kind of blown up the past few years and then look forward to like, what areas there might be uh, opportunity uh, for, for new gaming startups. Uh, I would say the last couple of years was marked by a lot of people trying to create MOBA, MOBA games to uh, piggyback off of the engagement around League of Legends. I think last year uh, saw a huge rise in the number of Battle Royale uh, style games, both on PC and then on mobile. Um, how do you view these type of uh, trends? Like, what can you do to, to spot them? And, and kind of what, what are you looking at going forward? Yeah, this is a, this is a tough one. Uh, and, and just so it's not uh, too much inside baseball, but I, I assume the gamers in the audience all know, but for, for those who are not like me, not as familiar with games, um, uh, MOBA is uh, multiplayer online battle arena yep. uh, genre, you know, that, that League of Legends or Dota, these types of games sort of emerged in the late O's, I guess, and, and really became super popular in the, the, the mid-teens, I suppose. Um, and, and, and it's been going strong for a decade and is a great new, great new genre. And, and then this new Battle Royale, which, you know, the, you know came out of uh, a Japanese movie from the 1980s, I believe, originally, and, you know, Hunger Games popularized yeah. as well. 100 people drop onto an island and, and last man standing wins um, type of gameplay. You know, came out of there, there. There was Arma, and then there was King of the Kill, and then it became uh, uh, PUBG, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, and then you know Fortnite, and, and has now emerged as this you know huge new genre of growth. Um, so one of the things that we look out for as a company, and, and we think about is um, gaming. To a non-gamer, it seems like one industry, but to, within the gaming industry, if you play MMOs, you know you, you you don't necessarily play shooters, and if you play shooters, you don't necessarily play MOBAs. If you play MOBAs, you don't necessarily play uh, match three. And so each of these genres is kind of distinct. It's, 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 they're, they're almost like distinctive, interactive entertainment genres. And, and so when a new one gets created, it actually layers on a whole new uh, group of players come and drop into the industry, a whole new you know, uh, burst of revenue comes into the industry as well, a whole new burst of creativity comes into the industry. And so what we've seen over the years is as you layer on new types of genres into different platforms, you actually grow the pie you know, uh, exponentially because you have both new platforms, new geos, and new genres coming out. And so one of the things that we were really impressed by, or we see the, 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 the health of the, uh, a good indicator of the health of the ecosystem is that you do have these massive new genres like you know, uh, uh, PUBG or, or, or Fortnite Battle Royale you know, emerging and, and bringing a lot of new sort of players into the industry. Uh, the million dollar question that, that, that you know, you're always, uh, as an investor, I'm sure you're always looking for. A billion dollar question is, is, is what's that next new genre going to be? Yeah. Or what innovations can you do within an existing genre to, to sort of emerge? And, and that's, that's hard to answer. If I, if, yeah. if I knew that, I'd, I'd be doing a, my own games company probably. But uh, you know, kudos to all the founders who are going after that. For sure. And, and I think one thing, uh, based on these last couple of trends, is there's a lot of popularity around taking these ex uh, existing game modes and trying to like port them to new platforms. So like taking uh, League of Legends, putting on uh, style gameplay, putting on mobile, taking Battle Royale, putting on mobile. And I think one thing that game companies should be kind of cautious of is like, who, who is the target audience? What games are they playing? And like, what experiences do they actually, like, do they find fun? And uh, I, I think in a lot of markets, like people who play League of Legends on PC, it's, it's tough to get them to, to switch to play the game on mobile. That doesn't mean there isn't an entirely different audience of people who would be interested in playing a MOBA game on, on mobile, as evidenced by uh, Honor of Kings uh, in China. Um, and so I think thinking really carefully about uh, the audience and what they're currently playing and what they find fun is uh, important for developers. Um, so taking a, a step back from the games themselves, we talked a little bit about a platform. So PC, mobile. Uh, like new app stores, et cetera. How do, you, uh, how do you look at kind of new platforms emerging as a potential opportunity or a potential challenge? Yeah, so when you think about platforms for usually for distribution, you know, after consoles there's PCs, and after PCs there's web games, and after web there was mobile, and now there's a lot of talk around you know, AR, VR, and I, I think you know, the, the web gaming emergence in, in the West uh, allowed, a, was, it was a nice bump, but it, it, it wasn't, it, it, it paled in comparison to the growth of what happened when mobile games emerged and the emergence of, you know, the iOS and, and Android platforms. And, and when a new platform emerges, you actually have new emergent gameplay because, you know, different controls, different habits. And 
and that's when you have like small team, like you know six, you know six guys in in Helsinki can create a supercell, or or you know a few a, a small team in Stockholm can create a Candy Crush, or or you know these 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 huge new companies that emerged, you know they they all came out around when the mobile gaming platform uh, uh, came out. So when a new platform emerges, you have this great opportunity and a lot of uh, innovation and. Uh, and then, you know, as the platform gets bigger and bigger, sometimes it can be harder to get distribution, and so the channel becomes more important. Um, and so, I think, ten years ago, you know, there, there were teams. Or Fifteen years ago, gamers would say, "I want to build a triple. I want to do a console game." But then, triple A became so expensive, you needed a hundred million dollars to, to to do the graphics right and to to to, to do a triple A quality console game. And so, you know, web and then mobile immersion. So these small teams that didn't have $100 million, they wanted to try something new. If you're spending $100 million, you're probably not going to you know, try some radically new concept and innovate some, some radically new, new idea. Um, and, and so you have these smaller teams that are more willing to try new things. And they, they experiment and they come up with things. And then you have, you know, Clash of Clans emerges or, or something, you know, of that. Um, but then now, if you fast forward to today, mobile has become a very... Um, Difficult place to get distribution. It's very hard to break through. You know, uh, uh, fin uh, uh, Finland has a uh, small small giant is one of the exceptions. Yep. It proves the rule. It recently emerged into the top grossing mobile games. You know, kudos to them. They did a great job. But but they are the exception that proves the rule. And, and and so people are sort of looking for where's that innovation going to be. And in the past few years, a lot of people have dropped into back into PC. Yep. Um, you know, with, with Steam democratizing sort of the ability to to for a small team to make a game and publish it themselves and not have to buy a ton of traffic. Then, then that allows you know five or ten or fifteen you know smaller teams to um, to break out and, and, and try new innovative things. We've seen a sort of renaissance in the uh, sort of the PC gaming era. So it, I'm not sure. I don't. I, I'm, I'm not so sure about uh, VR AR right now. Yeah. It, there's some really cool experiences out there, but the, maybe the distribution hasn't quite gotten to the scale. But you know, there, there's some really new opportunities that emerge when you have a new platform uh, coming out, and so. Whenever that time comes, that's a great time for new new companies to emerge. Yeah, that actually dovetails nicely with one of the uh, questions we got from the audience. Uh, what needs to happen for location-based or AR games to become mainstream? And I think that that's an interesting one because if you think about it, one of the most played games in the world already is uh, Pokemon Go. I think since the since Apple included screen time in iOS, people are realizing how much time they spend walking around uh, catching Pokemon. Um, but it, it, in your view, like, how, how do you view how do you look at kind of like AR as in addition to the mobile um, mobile gaming experience, or just that platform in general? Yeah, I think for location-based, obviously, yeah, you know, Pokemon's a, a cultural phenomenon, and, and you know, has encouraged a lot of people uh, uh, to to get out and walk around in the real world, and uh, and, and that's a very successful example of location-based games. Um, I, I think for AR, you know, the. In a, in a near term, there, there needs to be more distribution. So I, I assume that the major distribution platforms in the West would be looking at, you know, ways to get more AR. So you mentioned Apple, and you know, there's several others uh, that would, you know, that could get behind us in a really big way and and really drive a lot of uh, sort of adoption. I I, I personally was uh, fairly um, down on on VR AR just because. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not a gamer, so my opinion doesn't really matter. But it, it, you know, kind of made me dizzy, and I wasn't sure I'd like to, you know, carry the headset. Uh, but then I, I heard uh, Tim Sweeney from Epic uh, yeah. gave a talk uh, one time about sort of the, what the Unreal Engine can do, and sure. you know, rendering in real time, near perfect uh, uh, virtual reality, and how that could be integrated into, you know, sort of mixed reality and, and augmented reality. And you know, I, I came out of this is two or three years ago. He said it, and I don't know if it's, uh, you know. Five years, or ten years, or twenty years, or thirty years away, but it feels like, you know, uh, I think the catchphrase we, you know, that, that we were joking about, saying, you know, Matrix is coming, yeah. you know, and, and and it feels like in our lifetimes, you know, that will probably occur. I, I'm not sure it's going to be in the next couple of years. So if you're a startup who only has 18 months of runway, I'm not sure it's a great, you know, uh, use of resources right now. Yeah. But I, I think definitely in the next half a decade, decade, couple of decades, it's going to be huge. Yeah, and I think AR presents this unique opportunity where anybody who has a phone has the ability to be a gamer. And a lot of these uh, developers who, especially if you have IP that a lot of people recognize, like Niantic, obviously, with Pokemon, and then Harry Potter, uh, you can integrate AR experiences into any app and use game mechanics to turn people who think they're just playing something, like getting information on their phone, into an actual gaming experience. And I think there's a really unique uh, opportunity for generally app developers, not just game developers, to create gaming-like experiences within, uh, 
within their environment through uh, augmented reality. Um, well, I think we have time for, for one more question. Uh, it'll be an extension to what we talked about, the platforms. So uh, Epic Games recently announced and launched a store, and then Discord uh, also has gone into uh, using their platform to distribute new games. Um, what, what do you think of, do you think it's a good thing, a bad thing, for there to be like fragmentation in terms of like where people find games and how they uh, de develop and deliver games, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I think, it, I, mean, I think it's a good thing to have more competition, and I think it's a good thing. At the end of the day, I, I think that gamers will go where the really good content is going to be. And yep. if, they, if, if they have a game that they really want to play, they're going to, you know, uh, you know I, I remember being on a 14.4 dial-up modem and having to leave things on overnight in order to download the game that you wanted to play. So you'll, you'll go through pretty, ex you'll jump through a lot of hoops in order to get to the, the sort of the content you want. And, you know, I'm reminded of, I, I think I was reading the, uh, the Jaws biography, and I remember that when the iPhone came out, the, the introduction of a 30% you know, yeah. commission was, uh, 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 I think, a, a drastic lowering of uh, sort of what the yep. distributors were able to, were yeah. taking at the time. You know, and, and now if you have more channels of distribution, you have some competition in that area, you know, even publishers, people not who are on their own platform, but people who you know, take other, games and, uh, other people's games and publish them, you know, such as ourselves in, in China, you know, we have a kind of advantage publishing games to China, but uh, you know, even in the West, you have you know, other developers. You have to work harder to prove that you're valuable if developers have the option to sort of go direct. Yep. And so I feel like whether it's for publishers or for platforms, you know, everybody having to work harder to sort of do a good job of distributing a developer's game, getting it to the right community, you know, uh, providing advice and or uh, marketing support and or you know, operations support. I feel like that's all a good thing for the upstream developers uh, because it, it allows people who work harder to get more games, more interactive content into more people's hands, helps the owners to grow, helps you know, all sorts of good things happen. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's, uh, that's all the time we have uh, this morning. Thank you guys very much for, uh, for being here this early and, and listening to us talk about video games.